for a momentous day. So glad Brandon and Catherine are here. Uh, open up to Philippians. We're going to be reading. Uh, the verse today is from Philippians 1, verses 1 through 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I, war how I yearn for you all, you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, through the glory and praise of God. Good morning, everyone. What's wonderful about being a preacher is when I get a new job, it's just the exact same thing. But it's with different people in a different place, and we are very happy to be here. Uh, if you see in the bulletin, I, I have a little extra little letter that I wrote to you as thanks, but I, I don't think that could ever be enough. I don't think my words could ever be enough for the amount of gratitude that me and Catherine have for this congregation and for all the good things that you guys have done, for all the wonderful letters that you have sent us, and we have kept all of them. And we treasure those. We thank you for taking care of us like family, even though we are very, very new around. Also within the bulletin, you see that there, there's my phone number in there. Please, please, please call me or text me. Um, also, put your name in there. That way I know who I'm talking to. Um, but I want to get to know all of us. And if you have any questions or concerns, or if you just need to spend some time with me, please feel free to, to call or, or text or whatever is comfortable for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. For you are the high and awesome God. You sit on the eternal throne and we are honored to be your people and even more honored to be called your family by you. That Lord, we get to dwell as your people with hope that you'll come back for us, that you'll uh, take us out of this world and bring us into your home for all of eternity. And we look forward to that day. We ask that you would be glorified in our worship today. Then in what we study from your word and the, the things that we sing, that they be praises to you. May we be inspired for this week, Lord, that we be prepared for all of the, the troubles and the obstacles that we might encounter. We ask that you would give us strength so that we would stand in our faith with confidence that you are our Father. Thank you for all that you do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a, a wonderful speech out there by a guy named Paul Harvey called so God made a, a, a farmer. It's so, so good. And what I'd like to do is start by reading this speech, and then we'll get into our lesson. This is what Paul had written. And on the eighth day, God looked down from his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, milk cows, work all day in the fields, milk cows again, eat supper, then go down and stay past midnight at a meeting at the school board. So God made a farmer. I need somebody with arms strong enough to rustle a calf, yet gentle enough to deliver his own grandchild. Somebody to call hogs, tame cantankerous machinery, come home hungry and have to wait lunch until after the wife's done feeding the visiting ladies, and then tell the ladies to be sure and come back real soon and meet it. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to stand, sit up all night with a newborn cold and watch it die. 
with dry eyes and say, maybe next year. I need somebody who can shape an axe handle from a persimmon spout, shoe a horse with a hunk of car tire, who can make a harness out of haywire, feed sacks and shoe scraps, who in planting time and harvest season will finish his 45-hour week by Tuesday noon. And painting from tractor back, put in another 72 hours. So God made a farmer. God had to have somebody willing to ride the ruts at double speed to get the hay ahead of the rain clouds and yet stop in midfield to race to help when he sees smoke from the neighbor's place. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody strong enough to clear trees, heave bales, yet gentle enough to tame lambs and wean pigs and tend the punk combed pollocks, yet to stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadowlark. It would have to be somebody who'd plow deep and straight and not cut corners. Somebody to seed, weed, feed, breed, and take the disc, plow the plant, and tie the fleece and strain the milk and replenish the self-feeder and finish a hard day's work with a five-mile drive to church. Amen. Somebody who would bail a family together with the soft, strong bonds of sharing, who would laugh and sigh and then reply with smiling eyes when his son says he wants to spend his life doing what dad does. So God made a farmer. This is a speech made by Paul Harvey, and it was broadcasted in 1978 out of Kansas City, Missouri. And really, it was for the FFA, or the Future Farmers of America. These were kids, some of them looking forward to uh, graduating the following year, but they're looking forward to a future in agriculture. Kids who would have goals of working harder than anyone else, who would put in more hours and remain awake more nights, yet still lead in a God-fearing family. Like I said, some of these kids were close to graduating, close to moving out of the family home and becoming adults, living with adult responsibilities, learning how to take care of themselves and not having to call back for home with every little issue. Unsure of what the coming years might have in store for them. And so Paul wrote this as a sense of inspiration and a sense of a guide for them to live by. That they walk with integrity and they walk with dignity. You know, whenever I listen to this, I feel a little lazy in comparison. I don't work near as hard as a farmer, at least not physically. Farmers are some of the most self-disciplined people that I have ever Med. It's like they've maxed out all of their stats. In they're very spiritually strong. They're well rounded. But when I think of Paul Harvey and what he's giving out to the public, I don't think he's telling all of us that we need to become farmers. I don't think he's telling the people who don't pursue a career in agriculture to just disregard everything that he just said. What he's talking about is what does it mean to be a God fearing man or woman and to walk with this determination. I think his overall point is this, determined people do not put off their responsibilities. Now, if you see within the bulletin, I've titled this message, Beginning Strong. Because for me, this is a new beginning here. And I think we're all entering into this new chapter together. But for me, and, and this is just a personal thing, I'm taking a huge step here. And I want to begin strong. See, me, me and Catherine here are partnering with you. But we're not just a part of our family together, but we are here to work with you. We're here to serve you and here to work for you. We need you to work with us. And all of us together will be determined people who will not forsake our responsibilities. You know, sometimes I think about people like King David, where when he's a young man, he's known for his courage on the battlefield and standing up against giants. He's the kind of guy who would grab a bear by his beard and, and sucker punch him so he stays away from his lambs. But when he becomes a king, he's known as someone who aborts his responsibilities. He's known as somebody who will remain at home while his mighty men of valor go out to war. He's known as the king who fell into temptation. He's known as the king who sinned and tried to cover it up and made a huge mess of things. As a young man, he's determined as a growing man who should be more mature, he falls short. You remember how this account goes, how he's exposed before everybody. As, as Nathan the prophet comes to him and he says, you are the man. You remember how it goes. And the consequences that follow is 
the, the child that was being buried through this will die. That's the consequence here. And so we find him in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and he spent many days fasting and praying and basically lying just on his face on the ground here, hoping and praying that the child would not die. And then there's these rumors that he could hear. He hear, overhears other people talking and says, child's dead. What do we say to him? And when he overhears this, the text tells us that he stands up, he washes, he worships, and then he eats. And people ask him, well, why aren't you praying now? Why, why aren't you weeping now? And this is what he says. While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child might live, but now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. What I appreciate about David here is he understands his responsibility after he's done something bad. And his immediate response to the answer to his prayers is, I'm going straight back to God. He doesn't crawl back to God. It says that he stands up. He doesn't go still stinking of the few days that he spent on the ground. He washes himself and makes him presentable before God. And then notice, that's after, and then he takes care of himself. Afterwards, he takes care of his physical needs and he eats. And I think it's, we, we experience the same or similar drastic experiences within our lives. We, we might face a, a critical point in our faith or our story. And then we say, I don't want anything to do with God right now. He's not answering my prayers. He's not playing ball with me. How could I turn to him? In these kinds of circumstances, in the new chapters of our lives, we have the opportunity to either respond in a positive or a negative way. And really, that's what we're going to be talking about today, is how do I frame my worldview as a Christian? What, what do I do from this starting point and continue on? Much like all those kids in the FFA getting ready to pursue their careers in agriculture. What I mean by framing your worldview is, how do you store things in your heart? Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flows the springs of life. It's similar in the sense of how we walk is reflected by the things that we take in. The people that you surround yourself with, the kind of music that you listen to, the kinds of things that you focus on get stored up in your heart. And then the way that you walk is that regurgitated, digested kind of stuff. What you take in reflects on how you re respond to different things. And we have a tendency to frame all things through our experiences and how we viewed these experiences, like this internal influential categorizing system. So whether you already have this, this positive worldview or you are maintaining a negative one, we need to refocus here so that we have a godly perspective. How God views a situation should be how I view the situation. You, you've heard of having rose-tinted glasses before, right? That, that's where everything is overly positive, where no matter what the situation is, I see it only as good and I kind of forsake the bad. And that's not what God is looking at here. God sees situations as bad things too. He doesn't just look at the positive outcomes. How can I frame myself in that? That's why we need to be careful of what we take in here. We, we have a tendency to distort uh, some of the things that we take in into our views. And so if you look at things in a positive way, you, you miss some of the small details. If you look at things in a negative way, you miss some of the big details here. When we have a positive frame, we, we see that reflected in the day in day to day where you wake up in the morning where everything is hunky-dory. But it's the opposite if you have an, an opposite one where you have a negative one, where you're dragging your feet, where it feels like the, the seconds are ticking slower and slower on the clock. And you think, I can't wait to be released from duty so I could go home and just be by myself. Scripture will actually describe this kind of worldview in the book of Proverbs. If you want to turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26. And starting here in verse 13, it says, that describes first somebody called the sluggard. The sluggard says, 
There is a lion in the road. There's a lion in the open square. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the sluggard in his bed. The sluggard buries his hands in the dish. He is weary of bringing it to his mouth again. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who could give a discreet answer. Like the one who takes a dog by the ears, is he who passes by the and meddles with strife not belonging to him. There are three big things that we see from this sluggard. First is he makes excuses. I, I can't come to be a part of that today. There's a lion in the street, you know. There's a lion in the open square. I don't want to be in danger here. He's always making excuses. Two, he's always lazy. Like the door on its hinges, he rolls in bed. He sleeps in until the afternoon hours. I, I looked up the definition here of procrastination, and it says it's the act of unnecessarily and voluntarily delaying something, knowing that there will be negative consequences of doing so. The sluggard says, I know I probably should do it, and if I don't do it, it's going to reflect badly on me, but I can't help myself. That's just who I am. The sluggard also is a victim. It's too hard for me. It's too heavy of a load. Everything is so difficult, and I can't even bring the food up to my mouth. Yeah, that someone is, maybe if they are big and strong, they can just swaddle me up and take me out of the hard times. And they can take me out of the, the obstacles or the hard situations here. That's all that the sluggard is concerned with here. And that is opposite and contrary to the man or woman of God. That is not what God has called us to be. There's a contrasting scripture to that, not contradicting, but contrasting. In Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 27, there's a study that I found one time about the authentic people of God by biblical standards. And so what it looks like is it takes the authentic woman of God and takes the authentic man of God and lists off several characteristics that we find through scripture and says, how can my life be reflected like that? So for example, the authentic woman, she reflects she rejects false paradigms or, or patterns. She sees bad role models and says, I want nothing to do with that. She, she sees bad standards that women are commonly living by and saying, that's not really a godly thing. And so I'm going to reject that. And compare that to the, the authentic man who he accepts his responsibility. You know, Adam and Eve. You have Adam who, as God approaches him, he says, what were you thinking? He immediately blames it on the woman. Well, it kind of blames it on God. You're the one who gave me the woman here. She's the one that, that led me astray. Is he accepting his responsibility there? Of course. So within this, this is where I found this reframing the worldview. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 27 gives us a very positive, very godly worldview to live by. Isaiah 40 and verse 27 says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice do me escapes the notice of my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might be increasing in power. Though youth grows weary and tired, and the vigorous young man stumbles badly, yet those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. It doesn't matter if there's a lion in the street. It doesn't matter if I'm tired and I want to stay in bed. It doesn't matter if the spoon is too heavy to bring up to my mouth. The Lord gives me, gives me my strength, and he never runs dry. He never runs out of strength to give to me. He never runs out of power to me. Christians are not sluggards. Christians are, are the, the reason why faith is becoming so strong in the world today. And the reason why Christians do not give up is because our hope is in one who never gave up on us. Who's one who has never failed. Who's one who's proved himself over and over and over again. When you look at joy throughout the Bible, you don't see people just being happy here. 
Because joy is not based on outward circumstances here. Christians don't let worldly circumstances keep them from getting things done. That's why we're a part of this body. That's why God has called us to be a part of this body. Why he has employed us to participate in kingdom work. Well, one of the big things that I emphasized when I was trying out here was this. We are not a religious country club. We're a spiritual hospital And the main doctor here, the only big doctor, is our Lord, who truly saves people from their sinful and hurting and sick situations. When we think about our goals and where we want to go, it's important to reflect on where we have been. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, you have this amazing story of the prophet Samuel. And you remember that all of Israel, they they come to the prophet and they say, we want a king. We want to look like the rest of the nations. We want you to have the, to, to place among us a human physical king who he could sit on a throne and rule over us, that we could finally not look like lunatics around here. Remember, the prophet says, all right, let me bring it up to God. And God says, give them what they ask for. But in verse 12, it, it says that Samuel took a stone and he set it there, calling it, Ebenezer saying, so far, the Lord has helped us. Hasn't the Lord helped this congregation? Hasn't the Lord led us? Hasn't he brought all of us to this collective point where we could be together? And what we're doing this morning is celebrating the Lord who's done so much for us, who has helped us. And not just as an overall congregation, but in my personal struggles in the things that I'm tempted with, in the bad habits that I have accumulated over the years, God has helped me get out of those. And overall, God has helped each of us to get out of our sinful situations that we had no power of getting out of in the first place. That's the kind of God that we serve today. He never runs out of his strength. More importantly, he never runs out of his love for us. So far, God has led us. He's gotten me through this, that, and the other. Think of of how far we've come by faith in the good times and in the bad times. Everything has led to me being here today. You know, while Catherine and I were were packing up all of our stuff, it took us like three weeks to pack up our stuff and to sell the majority of our stuff. I was thinking about how far God has led me. You know, through my, my time in Adventures and Missions, through my, my time, through the, the, the schools that I graduated from, from, from going up to Alaska and spending time with a, a tiny congregation where the whole building could fit in this room. God has led me to many wonderful places. And he will continue to lead me to wonderful places, the same as he has led all of you and will continue to lead you as long as you make him your guy. As long as you listen to him, he's going to make you go places even if you don't listen to him, but far easier if we comply with him. What obstacles will I face? How will I frame my upcoming experiences? Because that's ultimately going to decide my attitudes and how I tackle those things. Will I rely on God and have joy through it? Or will I grit my teeth and just bear through it and fight him tooth and nail the whole way? From Paul Harvey's speech, remember that our, our point. That determined people, they don't put off their responsibilities. And that is reflected in what Jesus has to say on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, From Matthew chapter 7, Jesus will bring up uh, this imagery here of trees who bear types of fruit. This is what he says here in Matthew chapter 7 and starting in verse 17. So every tree bears good fruit, but bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. He's really talking about Pharisees, but we can have that reflected in our lives. Good trees are identified by the good things that they do or the good fruits that they produce. Obviously, talking about those who do what's right. Obviously, talking about... Christians who live by righteousness here, but it's not just keeping it all internal. It's reflected on the things that you do to other people. And obviously, bad fruit would be people who abort that responsibility, who know the right thing to do, but they put off their determination, who put off their worldview and see things in a negative kind of light. 
God calls us to be holy, for I am holy. That's the kind of life and the kind of attitude that we ought to have in our lives. There is no room for diseased trees in the orchard. They have their place, don't they? Jesus said that they belong in the fire, a way where they have no power or influence over us. You know, we're looking for results in, in habits that don't lessen my faith. And if I do have a habit that lessens my faith, if I do have a habit that hinders me in my walk with Christ, then I probably ought to get rid of those, shouldn't I? I probably need to adopt new habits and new lifestyles here. You know, commonly in, in our world, especially our nation, we put off things until January 1st. New Year's resolutions is what I mean. I, I won't get started until the new year. Why would I ever wait that long? Even if it was just the, the following week, even if it was just the next day, why would I wait that long to get right with God? Why would I ever do anything that would abort my responsibility or keep me from maturing in Christ? There's a really good quote that I found. It says, uh, deliverance gets you out of Egypt. Discipleship gets the Egypt out of you. Don't you like that? It's never more true than with modern day Christians. Every week we get to celebrate the deliverance that we have from sin through Christ. But we sometimes get caught up in not doing the discipleship part. Where I say, yes, Jesus is the Lord of my life, but we walk as if we're still the Lord of our life, as if we're the, still the center of the universe here. If Jesus is our Lord, then that means that the way that I walk, the way that I talk, the things that I say to other people and the good or bad fruits that I produce needs to be centered and surrendered to our Lord. Discipleship is where we do the hard work. We had no power to do the deliverance. That was all to our Lord. But we have power to do the discipleship part. And what that looks like, how it's described in Hebrews chapter 12, is running a race with endurance. That You have all this weight that you carry with you. Set it aside. Get it off of you. Anything that would hinder you from reaching the goal as quickly as possible, let it go. But the text also tells us that there is a great cloud of witnesses that is cheering you on along the way, and they've already made it. They're on the other side of that finish line here, watching you in your race and in your run and in your struggle. That's what discipleship looks like. It's through how we frame our worldview that we ultimately decide what kind of disciples we're going to be. Are we going to work passionately? Are we going to have the kind of integrity of a farmer? Or are we going to be like the sluggard here? In moving to Burlington, I thought of, I, I reflected, I guess, on, on Paul Harvey's speech on, so God made a farm. And I thought, man, I want to look like that. Not me, in the sense of, I, I want to be a farmer, pursue agriculture. That, that's not really my thing. But, but reading about the, these kinds of characters that Paul created here, I think I want to look a lot like that. And, and so in honor of that, I, I wrote something of a, of a parody of it. It's not supposed to be funny or anything. I think that's what a parody is supposed to be. But it, it's a version of it. And then I, I had it this idea of this is what I want Brandon to look like in his work in Burlington. After God had finished his redemptive work to save mankind from their sins, he considered the state of the world and he said, I need a messenger. So God made a Christian. God said, I need somebody willing to get up early, study my word, pray before he eats, get his family started for the day, go to the office, patiently and passionately work, come home with enough energy to play with the kids and check on the wife and steadily helping with the chores and the homework before reading my word again with the family before bed, and ending the day in prayer so God made a Christian. I need somebody with their heart strong enough to stand up against the corrupt morals and heavy opinions of the world, but gentle enough to love them anyways. Somebody to seek the things that are above. Work with integrity. Listen to little old ladies who tell their stories and invite strangers over for meals so God made a Christian. God said, I need somebody willing to sit at the sides of deathbeds into the late hours of the night with grieving families and somehow find the words of encouragement to tell them, see you soon. 
I need somebody who can walk in the light, know what is right and wrong, live with justice, build up wisdom, endure the suffering, and counter temptation. So God made a Christian. God had to have somebody willing to help others without receiving any credit. Give without receiving. Resist the urge to shake their fists at the sky when times get tough. So God made a Christian. God said, I need somebody brave enough to sit with the homeless, confident enough to stand on their faith, even when another cites atheistic works. It had to be somebody who would sow the seed, plow with their eyes forward, squeeze through the narrow gate, not cut corners, willing to sing, read, lead, pray, preach, teach, clean the building, shovel the snow, give uh, out of their wealth, cook the food, wash the dishes, and picking up all the chairs, all without grumbling or complaining. Starting every week, and meeting together with the church to regain the energy to do it all over again in the next week. Somebody who would hold a family together with the divine principles of Christ, who would laugh and having joy when his kids grow up to do the same thing. So God made a Christian. I'm not sure what God has in store for us through our new partnership. I sure hope it's good things. I hope we encounter easy times. I hope we get over the hard times. And I hope that we do it all together with the unity that Christ has created for this church. As long as God is still in control and Christ is still our Lord, I don't think we have anything to worry about. If you have not yet called on Christ to, to make him the Lord of your life, and scripture tells us the way to do that is through baptism. If that is something that you need to do, we are happy to help you out. If you have any other needs this morning, you could bring them known now as we stand, as we sing.